Cabo Pulmo is an ordinary, extraordinary place. Having solidly gone from riches to rags, it is now, with great effort of a dedicated few, regaining its riches once again. Among those riches is a small member of the Ray family, described by science only in the late 1980s, as Cabo Pulmo was establishing the recovery of its lost wealth of sea life. In early March of 2014, a team from Scripps Institution of Oceanography ventured to these re-blooming waters. This is a bit of that adventure, as it was experienced simultaneously by five generations of explorers, from age 6 to 96. Each day began before dawn, with equipment checks, a hearty breakfast, and a briefing of the day's planned events and contingencies. While the Scripps team made their preparations, the boat crews were equally busy, preparing to launch our four boats. Then, with some practice, the combined teams, now 18 strong, performed a well choreographed dance of loading and launching from the sand and pebble beach. Our convoy was led by the good ship Don Poncho whose radio call sign became Walter's boat, since it carried Dr. Walter Monk, the namesake of our primary target, the ray affectionately called Monk's Devil Ray, or Mopula Monkiana. Rounding out the passengers on the Don Poncho was Giuseppe, who first described the species, and our New York-based film crew, Eliana and Andrea. Walter's boat also had one other distinguishing characteristic, a flag from the Explorers Club flying from its stern. The club had sanctioned this expedition and in recognition of that had awarded flag number 221 to be carried by the team until the expedition was complete, at which time it would be returned to the club. We planned our daily activities to include observations of jumping mobula both from the boats as well as filming the animals swimming and feeding underwater. The goal of the expedition was to expand the available documentation on the behaviors and habits of Monkeyana, particularly their habit of jumping, sometimes repeatedly and high into the air, followed by a loud splash as they seemingly deliberately belly flopped back into the sea. Interestingly, most of our time as a group was spent analyzing not the what, but the why. Why did these devil rays jump? But first, we would need to find and then get close to the animals. And these bedeviling little rays decided to give us a run for our money. We spent the better part of three days on this quest. The hours of hunting were sometimes punctuated by innovative attempts to increase our odds of an encounter. After some searching of the local waters, we eventually settled on the bay called Los Friles as the best place for our work. It was here on Wednesday afternoon that we finally made first contact. Our first close-up underwater view came one afternoon when the persistent scanning of Brian, one of the boat captains, spotted a small school swimming under the boats. We were 
were finally in business and we jumped in, literally, with both feet, fins, tanks, and cameras. Snorkelers covered large areas of the surface, while divers examined the depths. Why were they jumping? One early theory was that the boys were showing off to their prospective girlfriends, but this was later thrown into doubt by observations that the jumpers were roughly equally balanced between males and females. New theories were floated almost as frequently as the rays jumped. experimental remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, was deployed primarily to test some of its capabilities. While its systems were being checked out, a pair of snorkelers gave the little ROV a good looking over. The primary goal of this effort was to learn about the control systems and design so that future versions of the ROV could be improved for these challenging open water missions. That goal was met. However, towards the end of the testing, at a depth of about 15 meters, the ROV actually captured a quick glimpse of a monkey on a swimming by. If you missed it like I did the first time, take a closer look in slow motion, there, on the right, and then swimming off into the distance. The interesting thing here was that the animal did not seem to react to the ROV's motors as it maneuvered for a better look. After a report from local fishermen, we concentrated some effort in the very shallow waters at the back of the bay. Here we found numerous juveniles feeding and basking in the plankton-rich waters. Potentially, this area serves as a nursery of sorts, affording these youngsters a sheltered and fruitful place to grow. We therefore spent quite some time and effort getting as much footage as possible. We used all our growing skills to spot, track, and then get good footage of them. He's right here. He's right on the... Right there, Octavio. Get in the... Put your camera in. He's coming at you. In addition to the monkeyana, 
we also observed large clouds of plankton hovering near the surface and close to shore. This was no doubt part of the attraction to this area, and we did observe several rays feeding with their characteristic rapid up and down swimming. The front of the head of these rays has what looks like two horns on them. In fact, these are movable fins, tightly coiled up while cruising. When they feed, these large flaps, called cephalic fins, unfurl on either side of their mouth and are used to steer groups of plankton into the mouth. If you look closely at the lead ray in this group, you will see the cephalic fins extended, the mouth open and the gills expanded by the large volume of water passing through them. Though none of us was eager to see the adventure end, at least for now we had accomplished much. Though the nagging question that began our expedition was still there. Why do they jump? We are, at least at this point, no closer to a conclusive answer to that question. But one theory that Walter offered early on had grown in appeal through our many hours of observation. Perhaps they do it just for the joy of it.